pain management is becoming a big thing nowadays. And we have data, you know, that uh, shows that, uh, you know, control the pain, we can increase the performance. Uh, you know, same way if we can uh, eliminate the stress, we're going to increase the performance of those cattle. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk on today. Actually, I'm, I have two topics. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk on this, and then uh, after this, to do this, I'll do a little short presentation on PIBVD in cattle. So we'll get started here. As I said, you know, stress and pain can sh definitely reduce the performance of the cattle. If we can help eliminate the stress and the pain, we're going to increase the performance. We all know what these stress factors are. Weaning, man, that's a big one, you know, when we wean cattle. I'd encourage you, if you can do fence line weaning, it's sure uh, a lot less stressful on the cattle, and I know that everyone cannot do that. Uh, you know, we just have multiple pastures, we gather the cattle up and the calves up and wean them. So it's, I know everyone cannot do fence line weaning, but if you can, it's sure a lot less stressful on the cattle and they really, they take off a whole lot better. Transportation, you know, we get these cattle out of South United, Southeast United States, Kentucky, Florida, Alabama. You know, they're shipped up here to us. No telling, you know, diesel smoke. Uh, they stop at restaurants, the driver stops to get a bite to eat. Uh, so they, they undergo a lot of stress on that transportation. They may be hauled from, you know, where down in Florida where it's 80, 85 degrees up to Oklahoma this time of the year, and it's, you know, got down to 20 degrees last night. Weather, you know, hot. You know, in the daytime, it may be 80 degrees. We have the fall weather, be 80 degrees in the daytime. It gets down to 40 at night. That's a big variation, you know, and that's really, really tough on the cattle. We can't control that weather. Uh, but we can try to, you know, keep our cattle healthy. We can't, but it's, it, again, it's a, a stress factor. Processing, definitely stressful on them. Uh, you know, we're going to run them through the chute, and we're going to, you know, vaccinate them, brand them, you know, dehorn if necessary. Uh, we're going to give them their uh, vaccinate, vaccines, implant. So all that is stressful. So, uh, you know, if we can do low-stress handling, uh, it's going to increase, you know, reduce the stress on those cattle and, and therefore increase the performance. We may want to sell to a specific market, okay? Believe it or not, there are, uh, you know, we have the all-natural, the all-organics, and uh, they're becoming more and more popular, and it may be that you want to sell to a specific market, and they're going to require, they want to know that those cattle were uh, humanely treated before you sell them. And... Who's going to do that? I'll tell you, it'd be uh, people like Walmart. They're going to say, you know, we're not buying any cattle that we're not humanely treated. Uh, we want to know the background of those cattle. We're not going to buy cattle that uh, you want, it will have hormones in them or implanted. And I'm a guy, I, I try to make decisions based on scientific data, but the buying consumer nowadays, they're not interested in scientific data. We can show them all kinds of data that say uh, implants are safe. They're not interested in that. They buy on emotion. And so it, it's, it becomes an emotional thing. If we're going to try to sell these cattle, we may more and more down the road, you're going to see this, that these cattle were humanely treated. We did, uh, you know, we helped control the pain in them. And I'm also going to show you, touch on a little bit of data that shows that controlling pain is actually beneficial to the cattle, and they, they actually perform better. Calves that require assistance at birth don't have good quality transfer of the antibodies you know, when they're born. Calves that got, uh, when I say, you see the term NSAID, that's not a cortisone, that stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, and that would be products like meloxicam and banamine. Those would be some of the NSAIDs that, that, that would be available to you. So calves that got an uh, NSAID treatment at birth, you know, they weighed more than uh, those that didn't after 10 days of life. You know what? You may say, well, that's only 10 days. But that first 10 days is very important because it gives that calf a, a fresh start on life. And so, you know, it can take off better. Uh, a lot of the research that I'll show you here is done up in Canada because they have drugs up there that are approved for, approved for use, the meloxicam. They have a meloxicam injectable up there, meloxicam tablets. So a lot of that uh, initial research, a lot of that was done in Canada. And uh, they take some heifers and they spayed them. And so the heifers that got a meloxicam treatment before being spayed, you know, outgained the ones that were spayed with no treatment. And so there's, there's some performance data out there. 
they've cut bull calves, you know, uh, castrated bull calves, and the calves that, uh, bull calves that got uh, a meloxicam treatment, you know, outgained the ones that didn't and gained just as well as the steer calves. So, you know, again, you know, you say, I I'm not into the humane thing, you know, I don't want to do it. But there's all, again, it's also a performance thing. You know, it can reduce the risk of BRD, bovine respiratory disease in cattle, if we help control the pain. That research was done up there at Kansas State University. A lot of consumers, the mom and dad and three kids and the brick home and a neighborhood, they're not interested in scientific data. You know, now they do not like the videos that are shown on TV where they excessively hot shot a cow or, you know, they toss a calf or they're kicking, you know, that, that it's a bad image to the cattle industry, and we need to get away from that, okay? We want to, we have to fight those type of emotions with the emotions ourselves, you know? There used to be some videos out there showing people feeding cattle in the wintertime, breaking ice in the wintertime, showing that we really care about our cattle, you know? So we have to fight emotion with emotion, and we got to eliminate this uh, treatment of these cattle, you know, with excessive hot shotting and... Uh, slamming gates on them and that type of stuff. You know, we, 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 we need to eliminate that, okay? One of the greatest things about pain management is it's also going to reduce antibiotic usage. That is a biggie nowadays, uh, you know, in the United States is, you know, there are consumers saying there's way too much antibiotics used on cattle. Tyson now has a thing in their chickens. They do not have any antibiotics in their chickens. Not they, you know, they don't feed antibiotics. I will tell you, the, the veterinarians who work for Tyson do the chickens, they will tell you they live with a higher death loss and they live with a higher morbidity rate because they don't get to use the antibiotics. But Tyson sells a lot, you know, Walmart is dictating that. Walmart says we don't want chickens with antibiotics. And so uh, you're probably going to see the same thing, you know, in cattle someday, you know, that it's not, you know, we got all kinds of scientific data, but, you know, Someone, a big Walmart homeland, they're going to dictate that those cattle have no antibiotics. So we've got to start doing things at raising cattle where we're going to raise them efficiently and, you know, control the use of antibiotics. So controlling pain management also is going to eliminate, you know, help on reduce the use of antibiotics in, in cattle. What drugs are out there for pain management? You know, when I got out of vet school, we usually mostly dexamethasone. That's a cortisone. And, uh, you know, we'd have a uh, steer bull come in, lame, and we'd do a lameness exam on it and didn't find anything in the feed or anything, you know, down low. And so we'd say, well, it's got, you know, this lameness is up high, we'll give it a shot of cortisone. And that's what we did back then. And, you know, cortisone doesn't last a really, really long time, but that was what was available to us. Cortisone is a, you know, really, really potent immunosuppressive and so it's going to reduce the immune status of those cattle. And so you may give them a shot of cortisone. Dr. Pensier used to say, you know, they die feeling good with a shot of cortisone. You know, it may, it may make them eat and get them to start eating, but they, he said, you know, they'll die feeling good with cortisone. And so it's a, it's a, sometimes if you want to use it as an appetite stimulant, I guess, you know, I've seen veterinarians do that too. But... Again, it's going to make them susceptible to other infections and everything like that. And you wouldn't want to use it in adult cows that are bred because you'd make them slough a calf, okay? Uh, you know, you have to be careful where, you know, where you'd use it. So, Other things, you know, you may have seen used for pain management is lidocaine. Lidocaine would be like if you go to the dentist and they give you a shot up here and, and numb you. That would be lidocaine. And the lidocaine is really good about controlling pain. It's just really, really short acting, you know. So, like after you get home from the dentist later that night, you don't have any, you know, it's worn off. Well, that's the same way within cattle. You know, the lidocaine wears off really, really quick. Uh, it does a good job of controlling pain, just not, not very long acting, okay. Aspirin, we used to have aspirin boluses available to us. If you want to feed aspirin, it's an anti-inflammatory, a non steroidal It uh, comes in a bolus, and also uh, you can grind the boluses up and, and use it as a powder. I haven't used aspirins in several years. We, we used to use them, and uh, uh, we, don't, we don't use them anymore. There's just some better drugs out there. Here's one that's used a lot nowadays. It's transdermal banamine. Probably been out, uh, oh, 
I'd say five or six years, you know, maybe probably about that long, transdermal banamine. The dose is three cc's per 100 pounds. Now they make an injectable banamine, okay? They make an injectable banamine and they make transdermal banamine. And if you want to use either one, you can. You just have to remember that injectable banamine goes IV in cattle. And most people, you know, aren't good at in giving an intravenous shot in cattle. So it has to go IV. The transdermal banamine, we're going to pour it on the back and pour it starting the shoulder blades, between your shoulder blades, pour it down to the tail head. Uh, you know, it gives about 48 hours worth of pain management. Uh, the dose on transdermal banamine is about 84 cents a 100 pounds. So you say that's expensive. And, uh, you know, so on a five-weight steer, that's going to cost you about $4.20, you know. Uh, but it does, it does do a good job of, you know, pain control. The one that's used a whole lot nowadays is Meloxicam. Again, up in Canada, they have an injectable form. Here in the United States, we have the tablets available to us. And we have these 15 milligram tablets, the uh, about 100 pound calf, you give about three of those. The problem is, as I said, they're a very tiny tablet. And if you have one of those calf balling guns, they tend to, you know, you'll put them in there, you'll pull your plunger back, you'll put them in there, and a lot of people walk up like that and they fall out. So you gotta be very, very careful if you have something other than this, or one of those small white calf balling guns, you know, that you gotta keep it up, elevated, and then when you go to administer it, you know, keep the calf's head up too, so that, you know, you're going in like this and not like that, or otherwise they're gonna fall out, and you know, you'll see them on the ground, and they don't, they don't do the calf any good if they're on the ground. Other thing is, if you're gonna use these, you wanna disinfect between calves. You know, tonsillar tissues uh, in cattle have a lot of salmonella, and so if you put these back there and you just go from calf to calf to calf, uh, there's a lot of disease that you can transmit to the next calf and on and on. So usually we'll have a bucket of uh, Novosan. Again, we're not talking about needles and syringes, so we can use a disinfectant like that we carry around a bucket of Novosan and we'll disinfect it you know, between calves, wash it out real good and, and disinfect it between calves. It's very economical, four cents a hundred pounds. So a five weight steer costs you 20 cents. You know, so it's very, very economical. Not easy to administer because you gotta pick up all the heads. You know, the lighter the calf, the easier it is, but the bigger the cattle, the harder it is. And I will tell you, if you're gonna do adult cattle, I would just grind them up and put them in the feed. Uh, you know, I wouldn't try to administer those to adult cattle. Just grind them up and put them in the feed. Anesthesia is not the same as pain management. That's analgesia, so we have anesthesia. It's not the same as pain management. But I do do a large farm. We probably castrate and dehorn 100 head a week. And we knock every one of those calves out, okay? We go down through there and we knock every one of those calves out. And a crew comes behind me and they're doing dehorning and, uh, you know, castrating. And these are 14 to 21 day old calves, all right? And then uh, we, you know, originally we were using uh, meloxicam, but I didn't like seeing these pills on the, on the ground. I didn't, you know, they weren't good at disinfecting. And so we just went to transdermal banamine. You know, our costs went up tremendously, but uh, anyway, we're just getting it doing a lot better job. Uh, but again, you know, why would a person do this? Because someday it's going to be dictated. It, you know, we're going to say, if we're going to sell to this market, they're going to dictate to us that, you know, I want your cattle treated humanely, and I want to know that they were treated humanely before we sell them to the, to the soccer mom or whatever, you know. So uh, it, it's, it's coming, y'all. Most commonly used drugs that do for anesthetizing those calves, I just mix a cocktail up of romp and ketamine, and you guys aren't gonna, unless you're a veterinarian in here, you're not gonna have access to that. Ketamine is a controlled drug, so uh, you guys wouldn't have access to the ketamine. But uh, I mix up a little cocktail of uh, romp and ketamine. Some of the things that we can do to eliminate pain in cattle, you know, we're gonna have to try to get away from this is genetics. You know, we can buy polled cattle, we can use genetics from polled cattle, so we don't have to bother with dehorning. We don't have to put them through the pain of dehorning. I, I 
really think that dehorning is much, much harder on the cattle than castrating, especially if we're talking about, you know, a big, a big set of horns on the steer, you know, or a staggy old bull calf. You know, I really think that uh, dehorning is much, much harder on those cattle, uh, and it'll set them back much, much harder. Uh, other thing, you know, we can dehorn them at day one of age. We can take like a clipper blade, a number 40 clipper blade, clip around that horn bud, and we can apply uh, some dehorning paste, cover that up with some uh, duct tape, and it's very, very effective, works very, very good. Now if you wait till 10 to 14 days and put the paste on, they tend to want to scratch it and they get it, you know, but if you do it one day of age, it's very, very effective, works very, very good. Also, you know, we need to castrate and dehorn at a, at a young age. You know, we need to be cutting these bull calves at a younger age, uh, not people say, well, they grow better, but I can show you a lot of data where calves that cut day of age uh, do just as good as their uh, bull counterparts, you know, six months later. Now, you'd want to implant them, I will say. I'm an implant guy, you know. I, I, I like scientific data, and I'm a guy that likes to implant. But, so if we're going to castrate them, I really think you ought to implant. Castrate them at an early age. You know, if we get those calves castrated at an early age, you know, we're going to eliminate. You know, it's kind of like doing a dock at a puppy's tail, you know. You don't dock a puppy at four months of age. You do it at three to five days of age, you know. And they don't, they don't use any anesthesia on them. And puppies will do great. Same thing if we just start castrating these bull calves at an earlier age, dehorn them at an earlier age, they're going to do, you know, we're going to eliminate, you know, they become attached to those testicles, you know, as they get older and older, they become attached to them and they don't want to lose them. And so it's just going to be a whole lot easier on them to take them out earlier, okay? We can freeze brand. I know that's a time consuming deal, but we can freeze brand. Uh, that, uh, you know, eliminates a lot of the pain associated with the hot iron. And I think what you're going to see uh, coming out on the market, uh, it may not be next year, five years, but maybe 20 years now. You'll probably see chemical castration. And we're going to give a shot, and it's going to build an antibody to, like, testosterone. And so it'll render that testosterone ineffective. And so, therefore, you know, we don't, you know, it's just called, uh, and I think they have it nowadays. They use it, they're trying to use it in uh, spay and neuter clinics, you know, uh, and uh, on wild horses so they don't reproduce. and. You know, they're trying to use, uh, I, I call it chemical castration. Uh, there's probably another name for it, but trust me, the pharmaceutical companies are working on that and trying to get that, uh, you know, and it, it, it'll be a great tool, you know, if it'll pass, uh, you know, safety standards and everything. But I have a lab at uh, Vernon Veterinary Clinic. We call it Okie Dokie Cattle Data. And Okie Dokie Cattle Data, we do uh, PIBV testing and we do blood pregnancy testing on ruminants. Today I'm going to talk about is PIBVD. Uh, BVD stands for bovine virus diarrhea. It's a virus of cattle. It's probably a misnomer. You know, I've told people and said your cow, your cat's probably got BVD. You know, bovine virus diarrhea, and they'll say no, it doesn't have diarrhea at all. Uh, it's a misnomer. You know, m the biggest problem with BVD is uh, poor doing cattle. Uh, you know, pneumonias. Uh, they're just poor doers and they got pneumonia and you know that's that's uh, again it it's badly named PI stands for persistently infected that means those calves were born with it from day one the day they were born they were born with BVD and there is no treatment for that calf he will never get over it you can give him all the antibiotics you want you are not going to get him well okay he, he is born with that it's going to be impossible to tell, you know, sometimes it's impossible to tell, you know, a BVD and a PI BVD from a, a number one. Eventually, you'll probably be able to, you know, that, that PI calf probably going to become a poor doer, become a lunger, and if I would ask you then, you would pick that one out, you'd probably be right. But trust me, you can get one to be, there are positive cows out there that are six, seven, eight years old that never became poor doers. And so generally they're not going to live to be that old, but there are uh, some of them that, you know, can live that long and you wouldn't be able to tell just visually looking at them. How does a calf become a PI calf? So here you got a, a mama cow out here and, you know, she's 30 to 120 days pregnant. She gets exposed to the BVD virus. 
it gets in her blood system, cross over into her blood system, and then again, she's 30 to 120 days pregnant. It crosses over the placental barrier and it becomes part of that calf because it crossed over the years, the placental into the calf, okay? So now we got a calf that's inside the mama and he's got the BVD virus in him. And so that BVD virus becomes just like his red blood cells, his white blood cells, bone marrow. That calf thinks it's part of him. We can, when that calf's born, we can vaccinate it. He will not respond to a BVD vaccine because it is not foreign to him. He already knows what it is. And so that calf is not going to respond to a vaccine. So, uh, you know, he's born with it. That's what, he might, that's what makes him persistently infected. And again, when he's, when he's born, he grows up, you know, he becomes a five-weight steer. Uh, he sheds millions of virus particles a day. And we can vaccinate our cattle. Uh, I like to tell people, you know, we can vaccinate, you know, the steer to up to here. But, you know, we got a PI calf. He sheds it up to here. He just overwhelms any immune system that we have put into those vaccinated cattle by the amount of the organisms that he's shedding daily, you know. So he just overwhelms these vaccinated cattle, and you can still, you know, have vaccinated cattle that become exposed. Now, those vaccinated cattle, they get exposed. They're not PIBVD cattle. They're what we call TI, and that's a transient infected animal. And so they're going to hopefully get over it. Hopefully it's not going to kill them, okay? And so that animal is transient infected, and he will get over it. But the PI animal, he has it his whole life, okay? Uh, the BVD virus, it suppresses their immune system. It attacks their lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes, you know, produce, you know, or helps what fights off infection, the white blood cells. And so it just bottoms him out. And so it makes, so when they're shedding that virus to other cattle, uh, those TI cattle, you know, it, it just zaps them because it, you know, they get it and lowers their immune system. And again, we hope they get over it, uh, and the majority of them will, but some of them won't. Those cattle become, I guess you could say, part-time lungers instead of full-time lungers, okay? You can have a positive calf out there. You may have one positive calf, but he's going to affect every animal out there. The incident rate of PIBVD is part of the United States is a quarter to 1%. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like a lot. You know, if you look at the numbers like that, it's probably not. But again, one animal, you know, we're going to find one in 400 or one in 100, you know, when we test. I like to, I like to say at our clinic, we find more than that. We probably stack the deck at our clinic whenever we PIBVD test because Lo and behold, someone will come into the clinic and they say, good night, I've lost 10 calves, or you know, over the last three weeks, I've lost 40 head of calves. And so we tell them to go out there and ear notch the dead pile. You know, and you know, we start with the dead pile a lot of times on the stalker cattle. And so we probably stack the deck at our clinic, we probably find a higher incident. We're probably up around two to 4%. But just remember, that one calf is going to affect several hundred head of cattle out there, okay? Again, testing. You know, the way that we test, uh, the most common way we do it at my clinic is with ear notches. And so this is a little pig ear notcher. Uh, we, I take an ear notch on the top side of the ear. Some of the other vets work for me. They take it on the bottom side of the ear. We take an ear notch and we put it in here. Now, here's where disinfecting is, is critical again. You know, I'm going to take an ear notch. Then I'm going to put this in disinfect it. Then I'm going to take it over here and put it in water. Now I'm ready for my next one. You know, we've had people send us in ear notches, and lo and behold, you will have, you know, three of them in a row. And, you know, there's just enough BVD on here that, you know, that it tested. So we recommend retesting those cattle. And lo and behold, he didn't disinfect between cattle. And, uh, you know, he's got... We're always suspicious when we see several of them in a row that they didn't disinfect between, between cattle. So, you know, take, take your notch, put it, put it in your vial there, label it. You know, if, it, if you're ear notching a dead pile, it doesn't necessarily need to be labeled. But if you're labeling, if you're ear notching live cattle, you'll want to put the ear notch on there, okay, or the, the uh, ear tag number so that we can identify it. And then, like I say, after you do it, just disinfect water, set it out there, and be ready for the next one. So we can actually test it on the blood. We had some people send us blood. 
Uh, you know, they'll want a pregnancy test as well as a BVD test, and we can actually do it on blood also. But the most common method is, uh, is an ear notch. What do you do with the positives? What if you got a positive, what do you do with it? You know, in Texas, they just passed a statute or law, whatever. It's uh, illegal to sell, knowingly sell a positive PI calf in Texas. Now, I got a letter from the state veterinarian in Texas explaining that. Now, I don't know what the penalty's gonna be. Have you read anything on that, Jenna, you know? I don't know what the penalty's gonna be on that, but uh, you know, it's, it's illegal in Texas to knowingly sell a PIBBD animal, you know? And I think you're gonna see uh, more and more of that coming. I know uh, some registered people that have approached uh, the Oklahoma cattlemen's and trying to get them to pass something, you know, saying that these cattle need to be PIBVD tested because I've got some high dollar cows out here and they're getting exposed to my neighbor's stalker cattle, as Jenna said, you know. So uh, we may see something pass in Oklahoma down the road. If you ask me what do you do with the positives, I don't think that you, you know, if you're got a set of ethics, I don't think you take them to the sale barn. If you do, you want to announce it, say that, that I'm selling, this is a PIBVD calf. But the only problem is you take him, you've exposed everything else in the sale barn. And I would say that if you go to Oklahoma City, OKC West, any day of the week, you could probably test, you know, they sell several thousand. We could test them, we're gonna find some, you know, out of those. But they weren't test. they didn't know that they were positive. Let me say that, okay? Uh, you can feed them. I've had some myself, I've fed them. Uh, as long as they're gaining weight, stay with them. Uh, there's some of the experts that say when they quit gaining, they're getting ready to die. It's hard to get a PI animal up over a thousand pounds. So, you know, if you can get him to a thousand, go get him harvested. But, uh, you know, you can, I have fed one myself. I've actually sold some PIs, okay? That, uh, and, I, and I told the person that bought them, I just sold them 50 cents on the dollar. Said, hey, this is animal is a PI calf. He wanted to take it and feed it and butcher it. So that'll be fine, just make sure that it has no fence contact with your neighbor's cattle. And I actually went there to look one time after he had it 30, 40 days, and it did not, so I was pleased with that, you know. But you, they can be fed. Uh, I would not recommend co-mingling positives, you know. You have three or four positives, I wouldn't recommend co-mingling because there are different types of the BVD virus. We have 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. I think that uh, letter has already gotten up to the ends and or up to the ends, you know, on the tree of these BVDs. So when you mix this uh, 1A with this 2B, they, they cross infect each other and they, they die, you know. You're not gonna get them, you know. So I wouldn't recommend feeding unless you get it top. The most common type of virus, we, we topped some the other day, like over 200 and something head of positives that we had there at the clinic. And uh, way over 70% of them are what's called 1A. So it's kind of interesting. Again, an antibiotics, going to become a big issue down the road, you know, Walmart, whoever's buying cattle is going to dictate that they hadn't, we don't want antibiotics in these cattle. And so if we can uh, find these positives, get them out of there, it's going to become an animal welfare issue, okay, so that we can decrease our antibiotic usage. I'm not going to tell you it's going to add value to your calf, okay. You may test, you may have 100 cows and sell, sell 100 calves. And you're going to take them to the sale, and they're going to say the PIBVD negative. They're not going to bring five dollars a hundred extra. I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke up you and tell you that you know they're going to bring more. Uh, you may see some select sales down the road where, whether it's Nova, QBN, whatever, they may start requiring it. You know, to for these select, uh, you know, had you know well vaccinated cattle. You may see that in the future. But right now, there's, there's probably not a value. And, uh, you know, a feedlot guy that's buying for feedlot, you know, he, he may realize what he's buying and know that he's getting a good set of calves, you know, because they're PI, BVD negative. You don't have to worry about spreading it out there in the feedlot. But the majority of the people, you're not going to get, you know, a bonus for the, you know, that. What do you do if you got PI animals? Again, get them out of there. If you're a stock operator, get them out of there. If you're a cow-calf operator, you find some cattle that, some of your calf crop that has PIBVD positive, then I would recommend testing every calf. And I say the quicker you do it, the earlier. You know, if you can do it at day one and find them, get them, get them out of there. 
Now, if you have a positive calf, I would recommend testing the cow because you know a negative cow can give birth to a positive calf, but a positive cow is always going to give birth to a positive calf. So I've never found very many positive cows, but they are out there. And so if you had a positive cow, you know you'd want to get her out there. And the other deal is people say, well, I'm going to test my cows. I'd recommend testing your calves because if you test the calves, you're getting a two-for-one test. I can tell you if the calf's negative, the cow's negative, okay? So you're kind of getting a two-for-one. Test the calf crop, not the cow crop. Mm -hmm.